it's Taylor and welcome back to Above Field Online, the show where we talk all about the NASCAR Cup Series and I am excited to announce a brand new segment on the show called Through the Timelines where I'm going to be talking to people in the world of motorsports, whether it's the crew, the drivers, the broadcasters, journalists, whoever it may be, I want to talk to them and I want to learn their journey from where they started to where they are now. And I'm very excited to introduce our very first guest to Through the Timelines. So without further ado, let's get to it. This episode of Above Fuel Align was delivered by DoorDash. Get more to your door with DoorDash. We're happy to welcome SHR Associate Shop Foreman of the 14 and 41, Brian Murphy, to Above Fuel Align. Brian, thank you so much for being on the show and welcome. Thank you for having me on. This is uh, this is awesome. I love doing this. Well, I'm glad to have you here, and I I already see, saw a little bit about your journey before, and. I think we can relate to the fact that I think you didn't really start watching NASCAR until you were in high school. Is that correct? That is that is very correct. I uh, I didn't grow up in a traditional motorsports family. We didn't watch uh, any type of motorsport. It was all about Green Bay Packer football and and uh, nothing else. So uh, when we moved to New York, um, my mom had to drag me to a NASCAR race at Watkins Glen, and and you know a year later I was headed down south to be part of the sport. Who was your favorite driver at that time? Was there one that you just that just stuck out to you? Uh, Jeremy Mayfield, believe it or not. And, really? Uh, yeah. So uh, the, the cool thing about a year and a half ago, I bought one of his his die casts from from that era, and uh, I was able to meet him and, and have him sign it. So it was kind of a kind of a, a you know a circle back to what brought me into the sport, and getting to meet him was was definitely a pleasure. Oh, that's awesome! That's so cool. Yeah. yeah. It's always so fun when things just go full circle like that. Yeah, yeah. It, it's a good reminder of, of why I'm here, how I got here, you know, and, and really the first race I ever went to, Tony Stewart won. So it's it's kind of a crazy uh, evolution of my career to end up at this place and and with uh, Tony Stewart and, and the person I saw win the first NASCAR race I attended. And then when you started getting into the sport what kind of drove you to start working on cars i saw you worked on late models or literally anything you could dip your toe into you did yeah so when i moved down here i you know i you know 15 20 years ago there were so many people trying to get in the door of every race team and and i knew nothing i knew nothing about how to weld fabricate i wasn't a good mechanic so i need to get my feet wet i need to learn the basics and um, I went knocking on doors, you know, believe it or not. And, and I ran across Mike Herman Jr., who is uh, the spotter in the Cup Series now. And, um, you know, he answered the door. He said, what do you know? I said, nothing. He said, well, how much do you need to get paid? I said, nothing. He said, well, come on in. You're perfect. So um, <laughs> he really brought me under his wing. Um, you know, through him, I met Tom Pistone, and I was able to get a job with him at Performance Center. And that's really where I started to build my fabrication skills and and uh, learn the basics of what it took to, to build these types of race cars. After that, I, I was there for about seven years. After that, I was able to, uh, you know, bother some people and get in the door over at KBM. And, uh, you know, we worked for, you know, outside of KBM, we, it was kind of a Toyota deal where we built trucks for Thor Sport and KBM. But um, that's where I really honed in my, um, you know, my fabrication skills. That's where you really, really started to get the artwork down the, um, you know, learn the tolerances, learn what it took to build these cars to, to be, you know, race winning vehicles. So um, about three years after being there, that, that kind of shut down and, and KBM and Thor kind of went to their own in-house uh, programs. And I was able to, again, just through word of mouth, word of, you know, networking, um, you know, be able to jump on over at Stuart House Racing. And that was really my first cup series job, my first experience in the cup series. And man, what a, what a ride it's been from, from starting as a body hanger to, um, you know, to, to now with these next gen cars, it's been quite the experience. I wanted to ask you specifically about your role. Technically I'm a, an associate shop foreman for the 1441. My background is, you know, as we talked about based in body hanging, uh, I'm not an engineer, but it was based you know, on, on aerodynamics. So, each, each, the team's kind of split up in two where, you know, you have the four and the 10 and the 14 and 41, there's a, a shot foreman. And then, you know, for me, I, I just, I go to work every day trying to make his job easier and trying to make everybody on our side jobs easier right now with the next gen car, getting information to these people as fast as possible so they can work 
um, efficiently and also produce uh, high performance race cars is, is my goal, whether it be, um, you know, just trying to do something they don't have time to do, trying to uh, take care of an issue or, you know, maybe getting yelled at or made fun of anything that can help make the process easier. Um, and as well, like I said, with my background in aerodynamics, I, I take care of a lot of the body side of things, the underbody side of things, try to just make sure those, those parts and pieces are tuned in and, and maxed out to NASCAR's uh, specifications. So um, every day is different. Every day creates a, a new issue. I, I go in trying my best just to uh, be prepared, but that's, that's part of it. It's especially just any job in more sports is, is whatever you prepare for, it's going to find something that you weren't prepared for and uh, make you have to adapt to that. So um, yeah, it's, it's a fun job. It's, I love working with people. I, I love, you know, I, I try to, I like to say, I, I know almost everybody at the shop and, and I think that that plays, you know, a big part into, to, you know, why I can do this role. And I saw on your Instagram page, I want to talk about your photography a little later, but you have a lot of pictures with trophies. Um, what's that experience like being able to be there at the track for those wins at Stuart Haas racing? It's, it's, it's been, uh, you know, it's been crazy. When I, when I first started at Stuart Haas, you know, we won our first race. It was actually, I think the anniversary was yesterday. And, and I saw those pictures of Kurt winning at Richmond and, um, you know, to finally make it from in the stands to being part of a cup winning team and, and, and feeling that joy, man, it was, it was something special. And, and even to skip ahead a little bit to finally make it to victory lane with Tony Stewart. Uh, my first time in victory lane was with him in Sonoma, his last, uh, his last win. And, and oh, man, I get goosebumps just thinking <laughs> about that day and, and the way that that race played out. So, you know, I've, I've been so spoiled to the point where like in 2018 and 2020, where we won double digit races, uh, you almost forget what it feels like to not win as crazy as that, uh, <laughs> where we're a year like last year where maybe we struggled and we didn't win as much it kind of reminds you it, it sets you back to appreciate you know every single win every single good finish and in those moments of spraying champagne and and drinking the bush beer and things like that so uh gosh it's it's crazy just to uh look back at, at where you come from and and to make it at this level is is just such a blessing, such a, um, you know, such a great experience, really. And you talk about having a lull in wins, and then obviously this year with Chase Briscoe winning, and just working on the, working with that team itself, what was that process like at the shop? How were you guys feeling when he got that first win? Well, I mean, we all, we've, everybody's seen Chase Briscoe's history, right? I mean, the kid is just an absolute wheel man. He's a driver, you know, him. Johnny, that entire 14 team, really everybody at Stuart Haas Racing are just a bunch of racers. They're so dedicated to um, winning races, to showing off our sponsors and their products and things like that. So, um, but yeah, to see Chase finally get that win after such a tough year last year, and it's it's so hard for these kids, Cole, Chase, you know, Reddick, all these rookies that came in with no practice, uh, very little qualifying, a, a totally different scene that, that a lot of the rookies, you know, that are winning championships now came up and so um to, to see them finally break through get that win um is so great for that team a lot of that team hadn't won a race before so um you know i i was in the fabrication side so i kind of you know i work for all the teams i i see it um you know some of those guys that work for each team they're so dedicated to that particular driver that they want to be in victory lane with their driver and to see those guys finally get that was was just so special uh so it's it's just something you can't recreate that first win and you talked about too you mentioned there like the rookies coming into the season having no practice because you know COVID and everything how rough that was but transitioning into talking about the gen 7 car has that been kind of an equalizer for the young younger drivers has it been almost an advantage do you think that they've come in with out that muscle memory of the gen six car? Uh, no, I definitely think it is. I think it's more an advantage for the driver side than it is actually the team side, the team side, our teams, they have so many good resources, so many good people that preparing a race winning car. Um, I'm not gonna say it's easy. That's not what I'm trying to say, but I think for to equalize everything, I think it definitely equalized the driver side more. Uh, a, a lot of these drivers that have been in it for years have, have gone through a lot of changes, whether it be, 
generational changes, whether it be the removal of the ride height rule. Uh, so to totally uh, reinvent the wheel, uh, as to speak, it, uh, I definitely think as a driver, it has reset that. And, you know, these are not comfortable cars to drive whatsoever. And, uh, you know, if, if you're not up on the wheel and, and stand on the gas, then you're probably going to struggle. And, and we're seeing, you know, the drivers that you would think are, you know, considered wheelmen stepping up and, and winning races or, or running good right now. And also with the Gen 7 car, we talked about it being like, you know, an equalizer. Um, now, because there isn't much for the teams to do with the cars because they're being made from a single supplier, is there any adjustments that you see being made to these cars that make them more beneficiary to a, cer to a certain driving style? That's kind of, I guess that's kind of hard for me to say. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot less side force with these radial tires are a lot more on edge. So, uh, you know, I, I, a driver that is used to, to running a car that is loose or, or on edge uh, probably will, will benefit from this. And I, I think we've seen that a lot of the dirt guys are running really good, you know, Harvick, he's, he's actually very methodical. He's a very smart driver, and he, he also gets up on the wheel. So a lot of people see maybe his, uh, you know, that he hasn't won a race as maybe a downfall, but the guy's just so smart. He doesn't wreck. He doesn't tear anything up. He's always there at the end. And, and those guys are just, you know, they're going to pounce at any second. And, and when they finally get that win, the garage is really going to uh, regret letting him do that. So, um, yeah, I, you know, I think these cars are definitely difficult to drive, but it's just taking, it's going to take everybody to figure it out. Maybe a couple are hitting it on it early, but, you know, in a couple months here, I think, I think everybody will have it figured out. And I know part shortage was a big talk at the start of the season. Um, has, has that been figured out a little bit? Have you guys gotten in more parts or is, is that still something that you guys are worried about? No, we definitely came a long way. Uh, good, NASCAR, good, good. Yeah, NASCAR, the suppliers, the teams, um, you know, it, it was a little exaggerated, I would say, kind of, um, only because, you know, us teams, we're, we're so used to having these unlimited resources, um, unlimited man hours, unlimited everything. There was nothing to hold us back. There was, you know, if we needed a part, we could order 10,000 of them. If we needed to make it, we would work all night to make it. So these new cars and this part shortage kind of put us in an uncomfortable spot that we haven't been in in decades. So, um, yeah, I mean, it was it was a different situation in the beginning of the year where we were swapping parts out every week. Um, you know, we started the, the year with only three cars. So once a car raced, it was immediately tore down, sent to the body shop and, and rebuilt instantly to try to make it to the next race. Uh, now we got, we got a lot more, a lot more parts. We have more cars, um, nothing where we were before. I mean, uh, three years ago, five years ago, when I started in 2015 at Stewart House Racing, our fleet of cars was up to 120. So now we're down to, right now, about five per team. The, you know, the allotment is going to be seven per team. So we have made a big, big step in, in a different direction. Uh, but right now we are, we are pretty comfortable. There's still some things that, uh, you know, we have to put on the car from week to week basis. But for the most part, uh, you know, it's, it's not bad. We're, we're, we're better off than where we were. And in two weeks, we'll be in, in even better, better shape. So, uh, no, it's, it's came a long way. Uh, and NASCAR, the vendors, the teams have worked really well together to uh, get, get to this point. And, and I think the future will only be better. And at this point, I feel like a lot of the issues that we saw early on with the next gen car have really, or I guess the gen seven car, I should say, have really worked themselves out. Something I noticed this weekend, and you actually posted about this on Twitter too, was the heat really messing with these cars going through inspection. Can you break that down a little bit? Yeah, I mean, heat has always played a role. The ambient temperature of, of you know, the location that you're going through tech has always played a role. Uh, you know, whether it be windows, Lexan swells up or, or, or shrinks a lot with, with a change in temperature. So even in the template days, you know, there was always a worry if you would roll through tech and it would get hot, if, if it would start lifting up the template off the whole car. Uh, fast forward to 2018 when we, you know, implemented the optical scan scanning station uh, or the OSS or the Hawkeye. Um, it's, it's, you know, you're, you're playing with thousands of an inch here and, you know, the ambient temperature, if you make swings from Martinsville to 40 degrees or 50 degrees when you go through tech sometimes, all the way up to Talladega last week where it was 86 degrees. That, that can play a massive role in how much these uh, composites, these Lexans, or even with the Gen 6 car, um, how much that metal will expand. So 
yeah, it's been something that teams have had to adjust with even more uh, since 2018. And, and like I said, the introduction of the OSS, uh, it's it's just part of the game now. It's, it's actually fun. Um, you know, there's differences between the track system and, you know, our shop systems. And, and after a while, you kind of have to learn those differences, whether it gets higher in the back and lower the, in the front, vice versa, or, or whatever that is. So you start to play the game, not only with um, kind of guessing and, and playing chicken with the system, as far as the system shows lower at the track in the rear, and maybe it's gonna be really, really hot. Um, you know, you can kind of, or really, really cold, you can kind of set yourself outside the box at the shop where you would be illegal, hoping that when you get to the track, the temperature change, um, the Delta change actually brings you back into NASCAR's box. So it's, it's just kind of a fun little game that you get to play. Uh, NASCAR understands this, the teams understand this. Uh, it's just something that we need to educate the fan base more so that they understand that, you know, when there's a failure, it's not necessarily an egregious failure. Um, and, and when NASCAR fails us, it's, it's them doing their job. So, uh, and, and also we're playing again with thousands of an inch, a change in ambient temperature can change anything. And, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's something we've seen for years and it's, it's, it's just a fun, fun aspect of, of modern day NASCAR inspection. And going outside of inspection and going outside of the cars real quick, um, you also have a photography hobby. I know totally out of left field, but what made you get interested in photography of all things? Um, so actually one of my coworkers, my best man, best friend, Justin Potter, he's a uh, plate leader. He's a body hanger at Stuart House Racing. He is, if you follow me, you need to follow him on Instagram and Twitter. His photography is, is much better than mine, but, um, just from, you know, hiking, going, you know, we travel together all the time, uh, um, both on, you know, race weekends or, or just, you know, for personal travels, uh, you know, he, he's taught me everything I know, but that, that's really what got me into it is, is traveling with him and, and him finally making me go buy a camera. And, and what I love about photography is, is it actually made me slow down and enjoy each situation, whether it be motorsports, whether it be a landscape, a sunrise, a waterfall, whatever it is, it's just, it kind of, you know, I was so used to just running past things or, or not taking the time to just sit back and enjoy that, that particular moment. And, and it's, it's such a fun, uh, form of art. Uh, again, I, I am, I, I love doing it, but, uh, you know, some of these guys are really good and it's fun to see, uh, the movement in NASCAR on the, social media side, the marketing side, all these great photographers, all these great artists coming in and, and uh, showing off their work. Is there a favorite photo that you've taken or a favorite place that you like to take photos? Uh, so if it comes to racing, Sebring International Raceway, which uh, you know, me and, me and Potter just went to that, for some reason, I, I never thought that place as flat as it is, um, you know, would really, put out the pictures and, and have the opportunity. But even as a fan, I mean, I have not gone there with any credentials whatsoever. It's been all, all the photos I post from Sebring are all as a fan with the ticket. And you can get up close and personal with those cars. The sun, uh, the sunsets are great there. It's, it's just a phenomenal place to take pictures. Um, and then on the landscape side, the Appalachian Mountains over here in North Carolina are just incredible. Uh, our, you know, Roan Mountain and Grassy Ridge Bulb our, lot, our place where we wake up at two o'clock in the morning and we'll drive out there and, and, and do a, a in the middle of the night hike and, and wait for sunrise. And that's that's just such an awesome place to take photos of uh, sunrises or, you know, the animals or, or just the scenery of the southeast. I will say I've seen your pictures that you've taken of the IMSA cars, I think. Yep. Yep. That was gorgeous. Sebring. Yeah, yeah, I love them so much. <laughs> yeah, no, it's uh, they're they're fun to take pictures of. They got lights. They're they're cool looking. Um, you know, it's it's a little bit different. The road courses give a lot more opportunity to take some uh, you know creative pictures, and uh, I, that's one thing I love about NASCAR and the schedule nowadays. Is I love road course racing. I love stock cars on road courses, and uh, you know, on the photography side, it it allows for a lot of creativity. So. I always get excited when we go to a road course to see what kind of pictures the photographers and what kind of content the uh, um, social media people come up with. And then speaking of photos, I would have to say, in my opinion, this is this is like not biased at all. SHR has some of the best paint schemes 
on the on the docket this season. Just my opinion, they really I already have my mobile one, um, Har Harvick one, like ordered diecast. I have it done. Is there a your favorite paint scheme? Do you have one so far this season? Um, yeah. So I, you know, I gotta give credit to uh, Derek, our graphic designer. Um, you know, it's it was such a tough deal. I didn't like the the change of you know the number place. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I wasn't a big fan of it at first. I, I didn't like it, but um, you know, for us, I think I think our graphic designers, I think the you know our marketing team, I think they just came out and they came up with kind of a unified uh, template. So uh, you can kind of see in, in a lot of our cars, you know, a, a distinction in, in kind of uh, design where logos are placed and things like that. And I think it was just a slam dunk idea. Uh, they've really knocked it out of the park on on almost every single aspect of this of this new layout and um yeah no i have a couple favorites uh you know i love the new haas haas scheme um the mobile one I, I you know i wasn't a big fan of the flames in the past so to finally get that that uh the red pegasus back and that that white scheme and, and that you, clean look I, I was yeah i think it's just such a clean looking piece uh i i can't tell you my favorite scheme um, because I think it's going to come out here in a couple weeks. Uh, it's going to be on, uh, Eric's car and that's all I'll give you. It's, it's, Ooh. uh, we're, we've done a lot with the metallics. We, we print a lot of our schemes, the gear wrench car, love that car, that, that, that orange that just hits that light is, is because of us printing on actual silver, a silver, um, uh, material opposed to just white material. So that's where a lot of our pop comes from on the Bush light car on a uh, gear wrench, on the Haas automation car. And so we're actually doing a metallic type scheme, but we're not printing it on silver. So I'm just, I'm gonna tease you a little bit, but uh, yeah, I, the best is yet to come. Uh, and, and I'm really excited to see this scheme come out. Oh, you're gonna make me wanna spend more money. <laughs> I'm gonna have to spend more money. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, they've done a good job. And, and, you know, and I think almost, almost every scheme that's came out um, there are very few that I go, oh, that was a miss as far as throughout the garage. You know what I mean? Uh, these designers, these, these creators, they've, they've done a great job adapting to this new layout. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, I was wrong, you know, I didn't like it. And, and you know what, it's, it's not as bad as I thought it was going to be. I would agree with you. I was very against it. And now I'm like, I'm kicking myself because they actually look pretty good and yeah, attributing can... to the graphic designers and everybody on those teams that are making those cars look fantastic. And then I'm really curious, what is your craziest story on the job? Something just weird happened, crazy happened, most exciting part of the job at SHR so far? Uh, so actually, I guess I'll, I'll just, this. so when I first started at Stuart Haas, um, when I first started in racing, I was very close-minded when it came to other forms of motorsport. So uh, I had a buddy that raced in road course racing and uh, he forced me to go to a road course, you know, love road course racing. And then when I got to Stuart Haas Racing, you know, I wasn't a big fan of dirt racing, didn't watch it, didn't pay attention to it. Uh, and everybody found out, well, oh. about, you know, about the first week I was there, Tony Stewart came walking over and, uh, and gave me a bunch of, of crap for it, you know, uh, lit me up pretty good and, and called me out on my dirt racing. And, and so I've, I have now gone to a bunch of dirt races to uh, educate myself. I love it all. I love it all now. If it's uh, a race, I can be there. But yeah, he wasn't shy about, you know, coming to find out who uh, who wasn't talking good about his dirt racing. <laughs> and, and it was pretty funny. He put me in my place and uh, sent me on a, on a, a lesson to learn about it. So uh, yeah, it was it was kind of embarrassing, but it was, it was pretty funny when I look back at it. And then to sum everything up, wrapping up, I always like to ask questions of like pieces of advice that you would get from anybody that I talk to. If you were to talk to somebody right now who wants to be in the job you want to be in or who wants to be in motorsports at all in any way, shape or form, what piece of advice would you give them that really helped you? Well, for me, you know, I, I haven't gotten a single job in this sport by handing a resume. Really, it's it's been all networking. It's been all through word of mouth. It's been all... Um, you know, people coming and finding me or, or, you know, I, it's, I've been very fortunate to run across amazing people in the sport, work with amazing people. Uh, it's, like I said, Mike Herman Jr., Clay Rogers, uh, Matt McCall, uh, Buggy Pletcher, you know, all these people, you know, they are, they are what grew me into who I am today. And, 
and you know the relationships you build in this sport are going to carry you farther than you expect and and so regardless of what you think you know or what you do know um if, if you have a bad relationship relationship a bad attitude or you know poor work ethic that's gonna that's gonna you know transfer farther than you can even imagine and that that will end your career so um you know networking is the biggest part of this sport and uh, you know working hard and and showing who you are and 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 being uh, um very dedicated to what this sport is is, is going to take you places it's not going to be usually it's like i said it's, it's not going to be you handing resumes usually it's going to be people coming and finding you if, if you deserve it Thank you so much for sharing that and sharing your journey. And that wraps up this episode of Above the Yellow Line through the timelines. Brian, like I said, thank you so much for being on the show. It was so fun to talk to you and hear about your journey. So thank you so much. No problem. It was an absolute pleasure anytime. And uh, yeah, I, I look forward to more episodes in the future. And then for those who want to find your work outside the show, where on social media can we find you at? Uh, so Twitter uh, at Brian underscore Murphy underscore and Instagram underscore Brian underscore Murphy underscore. <laughs> a lot of underscores. Brian Murphy's a pretty uh, a pretty popular name. Make sure to follow Brian there. I get the underscores, it's totally fun. My underscore is underscore Taylor Kitchen underscore on Twitter. So make sure to follow us all up there and then follow the Above the Line social media pages and Toby Christie Com on all social media platforms. Finally, I want to give a special thanks to DoorDash, PFC Breaks, SRI Performance, and Rhino.co for supporting Above the Line and Toby Christie Com. They're all linked in the description below, but before you do that, make sure to like this video, subscribe to the channel, share this with your friends and family, and thank you all so much for supporting the channel, and until next time, we'll see ya.